good to see you guys. Um, always good to see you here. So we've been doing a study on uh, the life of Christ. And, and again, this study um, is not just to give you, give you knowledge, uh, but to make us fall more in love with Jesus and, and to really get to know him. Um, so I'm going to talk first um, about Jesus' mission again. Uh, that's how I started this, this class. I'm going to go back to that again, and then we're going to pick up and start talking about demons, um, and we'll spend the remainder of the time talking about uh, demons, because we encounter a story in Mark chapter 1 uh, where Jesus cast out a demon, and uh, so I just wanted to hit these times that Jesus is interacting with demons to kind of stay on that theme a little bit. Um, so if you have your Bibles, open to Mark chapter 1. And we'll read verses 35 through 39. Mark chapter 1, 35 through 39. In rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. <clears throat> and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And then he said to them, Let us go to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Okay, so Jesus, again, his mission, and, and remember we talked about when Jesus opened up Isaiah, and he read from Isaiah, um, Jesus' mission is to set the captives free, uh, to preach to the poor, um, and to instill hope for people who are suffering. Um, Jesus never wavered from that mission, and Jesus very easily could have got caught in this, um, uh, in this mission where he, he's the master healer, and that's all he does. Um, he's living in a very poor, poverty-stricken area. It's full of disease, um, much like our third world nations today, or I guess they call them developing nations now. Um, you have extreme poverty and extreme um, disease everywhere you look. You know, a simple cut on the foot, it's not a scrape on the foot. It's that foot typically gets infected, and, and, and oftentimes they have to amputate um, limbs from simple scratches. Uh, there's feces everywhere. Uh, when we were in Haiti, I got tied up into some. Uh, we had a bag of rice. Somebody set it down. I picked it up and was covered in human feces. Um, yeah, it's, there's disease everywhere, everywhere. Uh, we did a medical clinic there, and, and um, it was absolutely packed to the point where um, there was nearly a riot. Dave Zersky was our bouncer, <laughs> um, and he had, to, he had to calm people down because people were getting angry because it was late in the day, uh, some people had been sitting there for eight hours waiting, waiting to see. Uh, it was Marianne Riggs and my brother Tim. Um, and then there was another doctor from, uh, from another uh, mission team that came. And so you had the two doctors, uh, Marianne, and then Dave was, uh, was running triage. So you had people who were waiting for eight, you know, eight nine hours in the blistering heat. And... Um, you know, at the end of the day, we had to, you, had, you have to stop at some point, and people started getting restless because they knew that we were going to be closing it down. Um, this is the context that Jesus is, is preaching in, so there comes a point where you just have to get away. Uh, and Jesus constantly is retreating and going to these, these quiet, lonely places. Uh, the sun's not even come up yet, so it's very early in the morning, um, maybe 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And um, Jesus is praying. And I think there's, you know, there's something incredibly biblical about breaking away from people who need you. Uh, we feel guilty as Christians, and we feel like we're letting people down, and we feel like we're not being good Christians if we break away. Let me remind you, people were dying. Uh, when Jesus broke away, this is not like people had a cough, and like, this is not American medicine, all right? People are dying, and Jesus breaks away, and he, and he 
goes into prayer. And so there's rest and there's prayer. By the way, the context behind Jesus getting in the boat when he goes over and and ends up feeding the 5,000 is to get rest. They're getting in a boat specifically to go to the other side to find a quiet place to get rest because the scriptures record that the disciples couldn't even find time to sleep or to eat because the crowds were pressing in so much. Yeah, it was quiet and rest. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so what's interesting is they row across the other side, which didn't take long. It's uh, The Sea of Galilee is six miles across. They get to the other side, and there's 5,000 people waiting for them. 5,000 men, um, that doesn't include women and children. So you're talking maybe 15,000, 20,000 easy. Um, and Jesus' disciples freak out. And the scriptures record that Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Um, I don't think his compassion was because they were hungry. Right? I don't think Jesus was like, man, we've got to feed these people. I feel so sorry for them. Though he fed them, Jesus gets off the boat and starts doing what? Right? His mission is to go and to preach. Jesus never, ever ever wavered from this mission. This is why he was here, was to preach. That's why I've come. You know, it's interesting. His disciples are coming to him in this context, and they're saying, Jesus, you need to come. These people are looking for you. You know, they, they, they need you. He doesn't go to them, does he? He says, let's go to the next town, and, and uh, I'm going to preach because that's why I was sent. He never goes to these people who are desperately looking for him. We need to remember that. You know, a lot of times we feel guilty and we beat ourselves up and we're like, man, I wish I could have done more. Sometimes you do all you can do and and you've done all you can do. And you have to be at peace with that. Right. That's right. (laughs) Sure, that's right. Yeah. Sure. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that, and I would just add, I would add to that and say that it's assumed that as a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're going to take care of one another. It's just assumed. You know, in, in Acts 2 and Acts 4, um, I mean, all, all through the Bible, uh, you, I mean, all through the Gospels, it's assumed that if you follow Jesus, you're going to, you're going to care for one another. That's assumed. Sure, Yeah. So now I want to jump into, um, well, I want to backtrack. I want to go back to uh, verse 29 of chapter 1. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they uh, told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, uh, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Now, a couple things are striking about this. One 
is that it keeps repeating. He's he's okay. He's going here. He's casting out demons. He's casting out demons. Casting out demons. You have demons that are just everywhere. It seems like um, definitely they existed. They were there. They were real. Um, and people were possessed by demons. What was striking is that um, he's casting out uh, many demons, and he tells them he doesn't permit them to speak because they knew him. Now. What are some reasons? I've heard some some pretty interesting reasons for this, um, but what are what are some genuine reasons for this? Why do you not permit demons? Why would Jesus not permit demons to speak about him? There you go. Yeah, yeah. The devil the devil is a master liar, manipulator, deceiver, and here's the catch. And I know this is a difficult one um, to accept and embrace. But the devil will almost always look like what? Yeah. That's right. Friendly. He'll look like your best friend. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really. It's, it's no joke. Um, demons, we picture some of the more violent stories, and, and we'll mention those. But I think when we hear demons, that's what we picture. It's the violent, you know, verbal, loud um, the the demoniac that uh, that had the legion of demons. And he's busting chains and he's naked and he's screaming and he's offensive and he's loud and um, I think that's what we think when we think demonology. But I think a lot of the times, um, what what we see is the the devil is incredibly crafty, manipulative, um, deceptive, quiet, gentle. Right, friendly, gets in close to you. So that's what that's what I picture uh, when we see demons. And then, what's interesting, and this is always true of the devil, because the devil's uh, just an absolute wuss. <laughs> um, because right, right, for abusers, it takes a little man to beat a woman or to beat a child. Um, the irony is we're People are so fearful of abusers, but abusers are little people. They're weak. And if you ever uh, want some good therapy, uh, go online and watch some, uh, uh, some online public court hearings when abusers are tried and given sentences. Watch them cry like little girls. Right? Almost always. It's these gang members, and they're tough, and they, you know, they... They walk around and they flash the signs and, you know, they're little, little people. And I think the, the same is true of the devil because he uses these opportunities to abuse the most innocent, the most vulnerable. It's like the path of least resistance. Today we're preaching on Job. Is that a, did anybody ever stop and think about that? Think of the absurdity of, of him selecting Job. Like literally the nicest gentlest, kindest person who would never hurt a flea? Yeah, that's right. He, he was wealthy, and he used his wealth for good. Uh, there was nothing in that man that was selfish or self-righteous. And look, at, look not only at how the devil targets and who the devil targets, but look, look at the extent to which he targets Job. I mean, he wipes him clean, of everything, of uh, it's the absolute worst torture. And so this is what this is my message when I go and talk to people about about the way the devil works. Like we think, um, man. Like I hear this a lot. This person must have some mental illness to go. Out. Like we even did it with this shooter, this guy in D.C. Like this guy must have had a mental illness. You know, to just walk on the field and start targeting uh, these these um, senators that were unarmed. The guy didn't have a mental illness. The mental illness is he's a, w- a wicked, evil man. And he enjoyed walking on that field and inflicting death on people. That's what he wanted. He wanted to do it. He enjoyed doing it. He wasn't like... We got this picture that these guys are holding these guns before they walk into elementary schools, and they're, like, rocking back and forth, and they're like, you know, should I do it, should I not? And they're like, you know, no. 
they walk in. Do you ever notice, do you ever see mug shots of, of these murderers that go into elementary schools? What are they doing in the pictures, in the mug shots? Smiling. Almost always. This is not mental illness. This is people who enjoy. They enjoy it. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about demons, which is why Jesus shuts them up. Because Jesus knows you give the devil a foothold. And you give the devil a voice. What's he going to do with that? They're exactly right. Sure. Um, yes, I have an answer. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, <laughs> you'll find out in the sermon today. No, there was one thing that nobody could strip from him, and it wasn't his wife. She did not die, though I don't know that that was a blessing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't think Job was like, "Thank you, God, for sparing my wife." It was just an, that. Was, mm-hmm. He did. Uh, there's no indication that it was the same wife. No. It could have been, but but I don't I don't think, I don't think. Uh, there was no indication that Job had any more than one wife in the beginning or the end. Yeah, so, I mean, there's just a lot of ambiguity. It's it's hard, it's hard to tell for sure. But but I don't think I don't think that Job's wife not being killed was a blessing for Job. I think it, that was one more. And this he, here's my point. Again, the devil. You just have to know how he thinks. Um, and we've experienced it in our life. I, I mean, probably most of us have, if not all of us. It's very true that when you're down at your very lowest point, when you feel the absolute worst, the most beaten down, the most tired, the most just, you want to give up on life. What's the one thing that can, that can when you think things can't get any worse, what's the one thing that will just blow your mind and you'll say, I never saw this coming? It's when your family turns on you, right? And the devil knows it, and the devil uses it. So, yeah, I, I, I think it was an absolute curse that Job's wife didn't die with the rest of the family. Well, she tells him to curse. Why don't you curse God and die? He's scraping himself of these painful boils, and she doesn't comfort him. She accuses him. She ridicules him. And as you know, in, in the sermon today, well, I, don't, I won't spoil it. You'll get it. You'll get it in the sermon. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on. Uh, verse 40 of chapter 1, 40 through 45. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling and said to him, If you will, uh, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. Um, uh, Moved, let me read that again with proper inflections. Verse 41, moved with pity, he stretched out his hands and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. Now, the reason I mentioned this and this is, not a, this is not somebody being healed from demons. Uh, the reason I mention this is just briefly because of Jesus' charge to him, don't, don't tell anybody that, that I healed you. Okay, so just tuck that in the back of your mind, because Jesus tells the demons, he shuts them up and says, don't, don't you know, doesn't allow them to speak, 
but that's because of falsehood. This guy, Jesus tells him, now the guy disobeys, but he tells him, don't tell anybody. Other places, Jesus tells them, go and tell everybody what I've done for you. So it's kind of interesting, um, but we'll, we'll circle back to that. Okay, chapter 5 of Mark. This is kind of a long uh, text, verses 1 through 20. This is the, uh, the guy who had the legion of demons. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately uh, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched, and the, uh, he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself to, with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God not to torment me. Is that right? Listen to that. For anybody who has any experience with any abuser, does this sound eerily familiar? They can dish it out, but they can't what? Right. That's the devil. How do you know when the devil is in someone? Isn't that an interesting question? How do you know whether somebody has mental illness or whether somebody is demonic to their core? I can tell you one of the very first indicators. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's so predictable as the day is long. They can dish it out, but they can't take it. You want to you find somebody who's demonic to their core? Be Jesus in front of them. Now, I don't mean like hug them and, you know, Charles and I were talking about this this morning saying, I forgive you. That's not being Jesus to people. I've got news for you. That's not biblical. Being Jesus to people is doing what? Standing up to them. Jesus stands up to this guy. He's not really mean either. Like Jesus isn't, he's just standing his ground, right? Jesus isn't, what happens when Jesus is on his way. He's not even on shore. Jesus is on the boat. He's moving towards shore. Where's this guy who's been inside the cave? He's waiting for him. Listen again. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered uh, about... Am I in the right? No. Sorry. Verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He was in the tombs. He sees Jesus coming on the water, and what's he do? He goes down. He's right there. You ever notice that about people? They're always in your face, 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 and they're ready to confront, 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 and Jesus does what? right. Stands his ground and he dishes it right back. And what's the guy start doing? Immediately he's on his knees begging Jesus, please don't torture me. Please don't torture me. That's how you know somebody's demonic. The devil is a coward and the devil will always back down. And, and it's interesting. Now, I know you guys are like, man, you're crazy and, and this just doesn't fit my picture of the devil and the devil's powerful and all this stuff. Listen to James. Re very simple message. Resist the devil, and he will, what? Flee from you. That means doing this, doing this, and doing this. You lean forward, you stand your ground. The devil will always flee. Mm-hmm. Absolutely.
and, and and you will be chastised. And and that's the it's the irony in it is it's the Christians who will come back and say you're not being forgiving enough. You know, Charles and I talked for a long time this morning because I was like, Charles, I got to talk to you about this this thing of forgiveness where we're telling we're telling people who've been abused that you need to forgive. Um, and it's your, and you have to let go of this bitterness, and you need to forgive your abuser, and the forgiveness is for you, it's not for them. And we require absolutely nothing of the abuser, and we require everything of the abused, and that's, it's just not biblical. And so a, a more biblical response is you need to pray imprecatory prayers. Imprecatory is prayers of harm, um, which makes up 40-some percent of the Psalms. 40-some uh, imprecatory prayers where... Uh, f- f- uh, yes, people who have been oppressed should pray imprecatory prayers against their abuser. You want to find healing? That's how you find healing. <laughs> See? It's so foreign. Yeah. <laughs> okay, prayers of harm. Yes. See? <laughs> Isn't that healing? Yes. But here's why. Here's why. <laughs> but here's why. It's not it's not because you're like, you know, God, you know, hurt these you know, I it's like, like you're not sadistic. Here's why. Paul says it in First Corinthians five, and you know, it's what we were talking about. Hand this man over to Satan so that what? so that his soul may be rescued on the day of judgment. It's a handing this person over to Satan for Satan to have his way with them because that's, you're only giving this person what that person already wants in the first place. They want to play with the devil? Romans chapter 1, God does what with people? People get to a certain point where God eventually hands them over to their own evil desires. God, God does this, and he says, you know what, you want to you play do do with the devil, and you want to dance with him, and you want to play with him? Hand, hand them over. All through the Psalms, you can't get away from them. Uh, where, where David, especially, is praying harm, uh, that harm comes to his enemies. Is that because David was a mean-spirited person? Uh, was that because David had bitterness in his heart? Was that, well, yeah, he did for a while, but, but, but those imprecatory prayers release that, uh, prayers of harm, that releases that bitterness. We're told that we need to forgive the abusers, forgi- you know, pray these wonderful prayers of forgiveness for our abusers. We're, that requires what of you? You're releasing, yeah, you're releasing somebody who has done nothing to be released. They don't want to be released. They're laughing at you. That's biblical. Yeah, that's that's biblical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. So that's a biblical view of forgiveness. So so all that to say, like, if, if, you want, if you really want to test somebody and find out, is this person really, is this person really demonic? Um, have they been dancing with the devil? Look like Jesus to them. Stand your ground. Don't back away. And you'll find out that what rises to the surface immediately? Anger. That's right. Anger is always the first response. Always the first response. You'll never find somebody say, you know what, I was, I was wrong. Or hurt, Right? Have we ever been accused of doing something where where you come back and you're like, how did you get that? Like, that was not my intention. Like, we've all been there, right? What's your first response? Yeah, you defend yourself, but specifically, what do you feel inside? Reflection. How about how about hurt? Yeah, you're you're not angry. You're hurt. That you're hurt that number one that somebody could see you in that light. And number two, that you did something that could, could be perceived or that actually did hurt somebody. Hurt is the first response from somebody who's not, who's not this demonic person. Anger is always the first response from, what do you mean? You idiot! You're the one with the problem! You know? Like, when somebody comes back at you with that kind of force, 
you know that this person maybe is not demonic at the core, but they're sure flirting with it. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, unapologetically. You know, and it's interesting what he does to to the demons here. And and let's, you know, we'll finish with this passage cuz I I really want to um I really want to finish this up. We have like 5 minutes. Um because it's so powerful, so powerful. Uh, chapter 5, uh, mm, we'll pick up verse 5. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Why was he cutting himself, by the way? Uh, maybe. Could be, Yeah. Uh, we certainly find that with the little child, night and day, you know, from the time he was little. He, it, these demons would often throw him into the fire or water to kill him. Yeah, that, uh, that, could, that could be. Uh, another angle, and I, 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 it's opinion, could be, I'm not really sure. But uh, when people become self-injurious, other people um, uh, injure you, injure yourself, self-injurious, people become uh, what towards you? Compassionate, sympathetic, compassionate. So this guy's up there. He's cutting himself. He's crying out. Uh, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him to torment me. Or he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him. You notice this theme? They're, yeah, pigs fly, begging, 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 begging. It's just this rapid fire. These demons are begging Jesus. Send us into the pigs. Let us, not, uh, let us enter them. Verse 13. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out, entered the pigs and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their uh, region. I think that's a little play on this, because now the people are begging Jesus. They're saying, please leave. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with him. So now the man in his right mind is the one begging. Jesus, please let me be with you. Let me follow you. And this is contrast to what we had just read in chapter 1. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. And how he has had mercy on. Now he's telling this guy, go tell everybody. The guy in chapter one, don't tell anybody. This guy, go tell, go tell your family how God has had mercy on you. And he went away and claimed in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Okay, a couple things. One, the pig thing is not really that interesting to me. Yeah. Uh huh. I don't know. They're in the abyss. Uh, Jewish Jewish people had this thought that water was was chaos. Uh, the devil was in the water. Leviathan. You have these sea monsters. Um, most Jewish people, even fishermen, could not swim. They wouldn't be caught dead in the waters because the waters is where the devil played. The devil the devil was underneath the water, uh, was in the water. Uh, it was chaos. Uh, when even Jonah, when Jonah's on the boat and the storm rises up, what does Jonah say? 
I've made God angry. Throw me into the sea. Feed me to the devil is what he's saying. Feed me to the devil because I deserve that. I've sinned and the seas will be calm. Right? So, um, so I think uh, that at least in the Jewish mind, uh, the, the pig dying didn't really matter. It's not like the demons like came out of the water and were floating. I think that was just a pure sign that the demons were where they belong. They're in this chaotic sea. They joined up with the Leviathan. And, and if you think, it adds a little bit inter- interesting twist to Jesus walking on the water and Jesus says to Peter, what? This is the same lake. The Sea of Galilee, this is where these, these demons are under that water. And Peter steps out on the water. I don't think Peter was afraid of the storm, per se. I think he was afraid when his foot stepped foot on water. The Jewish mind thought, the devil's going to pull me under. Leviathan's going to get me. This is, what, this is what was going through Peter's mind. Peter was terrified. And Jesus says, you have little faith. I don't think Jesus... I don't necessarily think Jesus is saying, Peter, you need to follow my example and look, I'm walking on water. I think what, what Jesus is saying is trust me that I have dominion because Peter's seen this stuff. Peter was here this day. Peter witnessed this violent demon, legion of demons. Peter witnessed it. And I think when Jesus said, Peter, have faith, um, he was saying, you need to trust that I have power and dominion over the demons, even the demons in this storm, I have control over. Gives a little different twist to that. Um, oh, man, the time. I hate that clock. Um, I, no, I still wouldn't have finished. I'm going to say this. In the right mind, verse 15. Um, they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. This word is really important. We don't get it in the English. This word is a compound word, which means safe. It comes, the word is um, sof, uh, sofraneo, and it comes from two words, uh, soros, which means safe, and frain, which means something that regulates life. And it, in the English language, it's where we get the word diaphragm from. We get the word diaphragm from this word. The diaphragm, it, it regulates life. It regulates breath. So safe life, literally, are the two compound words, safe life. And it means, uh, it's trans, translated to, uh, to mean something like um, self-control um, because it's self-regulating, safe regulating the man was safe now it's a pl- it's a little bit of a play on words but it means the man was safe and he was being self-regulated he was now sustained uh by god's spirit yes yeah that word uh it's translated in his right mind it's one word and it means safe and and being self-sustained um, okay, we better stop there. We're, we're, 